We, the people of Immaculate Parish, are committed to the mission of Jesus Christ and His Church. As the people of God, our mission is to grow in knowledge of our Catholic faith, leading to a deeper understanding of life with God. To come together to love and worship God in the Eucharistic liturgy and the sacraments that are vibrant with true faith. To take this faith and serve God by dedicating our, our time, time, talent, and treasure to live, teach, and proclaim the good news of Jesus to all people. We devote ourselves to this mission through the power of the Holy Spirit in the intercession of Mary Immaculate. Immaculate Parish presents 50 Years of Service, a mission of faith. The year was 1954. RCA introduces the first U.S. color television set. Veterans Day becomes a national holiday. The Supreme Court rules 9-0 in Brown v. Board of Education that racial segregation in public schools is unconstitutional. Industries were growing all across America. Like the rest of the nation, Owensboro, Kentucky was experiencing change and growth. Downtown Owensboro catered to consumers who were looking for everything from a suit to typewriters. While many folks preferred a nice stroll to town, a growing number of people began to use the automobile as a way to see the sights. While downtown thrived as the retail center, the Owensboro Industrial Development Foundation began to raise funds to attract industry and to expand the limits of Owensboro. The Catholic community was alive and well during this period with St. Stephen, Blessed Sacrament, Saints Joseph and Paul, and Blessed Mother leading Owensboro families in faith and worship. All around Owensboro, new subdivisions were pushing families to the south and to the west. And with these new homes came the need for new parishes. Parish of the Immaculate was created by the decree of Bishop Francis R. Cotton on April 19, 1954. The land that once nurtured a 10-acre cornfield now is the foundation of a church, school, rectory, and sister's residence that nurtures its parishioners and holds steady the daily life of 200 families. The first Mass was celebrated on August 22, 1954, the Feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary by its first pastor, Father Charles Carrico of St. Jerome Fancy Farm. During Father Carrico's tenure, the four-room school opened in August of 1954. Sister Callista, OSU, was the first principal and also taught grades six, seven, and eight. More rooms were added the next year to accommodate the first year attendance of 166 students. Father Carrico was a very, very spiritual, very humble individual. One day he showed up with a bushel of apples at 5 o'clock, 5.30 in the afternoon to eat the evening meal with us when uh, everything was in uproar as naturally with a family of seven, six, and we had six at that time. And what he said, he says, I don't want to put you out of, uh, out of the way. I just want to enjoy and be with you. And uh, I remember he had this bush, a great big bushel of apples. And he spent the evening with us. With, uh, and we had young kids at that time. And he was just a humble down to earth. On May 2nd, 1955, the St. Vincent de Paul Society was organized and the Altar Society followed on May 17, 1955. Last time I saw him alive, he was in Louisville at St. Joseph Hospital. It was about two years, before, uh, two weeks before he died. And I went in and sat down, and there was a little lamp on, and I spent some time with him. 
Father Carrico is reported to be very low. All treatments for his recovery have been discontinued. Pray for him. I, I think he's one of the holiest uh, priests that I've ever had the privilege of knowing. February 10th, 1957, the beloved Father Carrico died in Louisville. The bulletin extends thanks to all for their kindness to their pastor in his illness and death, especially for the prayers, Holy Communion, and Masses offered for him. After Father Clarence Petit fulfilled his duties as interim pastor, Father Leo J. Dinas was appointed pastor on September 15, 1957. During the 19 years Father Dinas was pastor, many changes occurred within the Immaculate Community. The parish grew to 600 families. Change could be seen across the faith community during the late 1950s. In July of 1959, Immaculate welcomed Father Borman as a guest in the rectory while Our Lady of Lourdes was being constructed just south of the city limits on the east side of the Livermore Road. In 1960, Sister Mary Lawrence replaced Sister Callista as the new superior of the school, and the community lost a devoted spiritual father in Bishop Cotton. By the end of 1962, the 25th anniversary of the Diocese of Owensboro, the church community witnessed the installation of a new bishop, the most Reverend Henry J. Seneca, the continued growth of the school system, the need for prayers during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the beginnings of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council. Throughout the 1960s, Immaculate Parish flourished as a social and spiritual hub. The school had both sister and lay teachers, and two rooms for each grade with a number of registered students reaching nearly 600. The Christian Family Movement the Youth Club, Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts, Girl Scouts, and Brownies flourished during this period. That was my life. That parish was my life. I served Mass uh, during the week. I can't tell you how many times. Uh, it was uh, uh, my life uh, revolved around Immaculate. Uh, we went to Mass uh, uh, every day. You know, you, you would begin school with Mass. And then after school, uh, you know, our friends were our classmates, and we roamed all over this uh, area and uh, through the cornfields and, and everything else that was around. So it was uh, a lot of good memories from Immaculate. On May 29, 1966, the groundbreaking ceremonies were held for the new church that would be built just south of the existing church and school. A rosary and benediction service was held following the ceremony to ask God's blessing during the period of construction. Aiden Construction Company was awarded the contract to build the new church. The Max Bisson architectural firm and Joe Cilia spearheaded the plans for the new church. Uh, my name is Joe Cilia. I used to work in architecture. Then that's where the new church goes, and I uh, did the design work on it, and, and it supervised its construction. And... Well, very few people were in charge. Uh, Father Dennis mostly. Most of Father Dennis and I were in charge. You know? and, well, of course, Father Dennis knew me, so he said, you're the man, so. On May 14th, 1967, an open house was held for the new church and the solemn dedication was held on May 21st by the bishop. The beautiful church complete with its terrazzo floor, marble walls, new pews, and leaded art glass was a concrete reflection of the sacrifices the parishioners have endured in serving the Lord and demonstrated the love they had for Jesus. By the end of the 1960s, the spiritual report of the pastor had registered some very impressive numbers. Nearly 700 confirmations, 552 baptisms, 70 marriages, 
and over three quarters of a million communions had taken place during the first 16 years of existence of Immaculate Parish. During the 1960s, the United States and the world were undergoing drastic changes and were experiencing new and complex moral issues. Despite advances in space travel and civil rights, poverty levels increased and America's homeless became a new demographic in the United States. Young people began to drop out of school and church. Marriage began to end in divorce at alarming rates. And the prospect of war lurked at every corner of the globe. With a chaotic world as the backdrop, the Second Vatican Council began its mission to update the church and to renovate its teaching for a new world. Bishop Sinecker explained this process to the Owensboro Rotary Club on August 13, 1964 by stating, the council will not invoke basic doctrines of the church, but will change the methods of presenting these to the priests and to the world. One of the concepts that came to be during the council was a universal call to holiness. This call meant that everyone in the world, including Owensboro, needed to become a minister to each other. This radical new idea of sharing your own personal stories of faith would take some time to materialize within the body of the church. A larger role for women was realized. On April 2, 1964, the first regularly scheduled afternoon mass was announced in Owensboro. The change in the way communion was distributed was put into effect on May of 1964. Each person receiving communion was now expected to say an audible Amen to proclaim their belief in the presence of Christ. The words Holy Ghost were replaced with Holy Spirit, affecting many prayers used throughout services. On November 5th, the liturgy was to be prayed in the vernacular of the people for which it was said. For the people of the Immaculate Parish, this meant the liturgy would be celebrated in English. Other changes included the call for priests to face the people during the celebration of Mass. The ritual of the offertory procession, the sign of peace, the practice of having weekly Masses and multiple services on weekends were all implemented after Vatican II. The church had truly become a place for the people of God. At Immaculate, Father Dinas appointed the first lay ministers in 1973. Joseph Wedding, David Gasser, Al Clark, James Jackson, Joseph Lauzon, and his son Peter, a seminarian distributed communion on Sunday at Holy Day Masses. The church bulletin addressed another social change in its January 28, 1973 edition. The recent disgraceful decision of our Supreme Court in no way changes the moral aspect and most serious wrong of abortion. May God be merciful to us. Another social concern was addressed in the August 10, 1975 edition of the church bulletin, Vietnam Refugees Resettlement. Additional data on this program can be obtained by calling Father Leonard Rice. It is clear that by the 1970s, Immaculate Parish was in the trenches with many social concerns and was working for just results in an unjust world. Monsignor Bernard Powers became the third pastor of Immaculate in 1976 on the heels of the Second Vatican Council. Father Powers, with the help of assistant pastor Father Mari Reini, would help guide the faith community in this new era of the Catholic Church. I'm Monsignor Bernard Powers, and I've been a priest for 52 years. I followed Father Dinas at Immaculate, and when I went there, the people were ready for, for the fruit of the Second Vatican Council and the teachings of the Second Vatican Council. I, I know that when I went there, there was um, there, there was a nucleus of, <clears throat> of people who were, you know, kind of fixed in ways of not wanting to move. And then there was a large group of people who did want to, to move with the changes and accept the changes of the Second Vatican Council. And I think overall there was a, there was a good movement on the part of all the people, some of them much more rapidly than the others. Social activities continued at Immaculate throughout the 1970s. The first Youth for Life meeting took place in 1976. The boys' choir began their rehearsals. The football team won the city championship. 
On December 2, 1979, the church celebrated its 25th anniversary with a special mass. On October 26, 1982, Bishop Sinecker announced that Pope John Paul II had appointed a new bishop for the Diocese and Church of Owensboro. Bishop John Jeremiah McRaith had been pastor in three rural parishes and had worked with priests, religious, and lay people from all walks of life. His formative experiences as a priest prior to coming to Owensboro were almost entirely post-Vatican II. Bishop McRaith left no doubt about the influence of the Second Council when his ordination in relation was held at the Owensboro Sports Center. Keith Lawrence, a reporter covering the ceremony for the Messenger Inquirer, recalls this blessed event. Back in 1982, during the installation ceremonies for uh, Bishop McRaith, I was a religion reporter. I covered religion from about 1976 to 1985. It, uh, there were over 6,000 people, I think, in the sports center, and it doesn't seat that many now. Two o'clock in the afternoon, I think, for something that started at six, they had people from, of course, all over the diocese and several other states, too. Something ones where I hadn't seen before. A lot of people came that uh, weren't Catholics. They wanted to see it. It was something different. I think it was a time of, uh, of a new generation, probably for the church and for the the community. Uh, Bishop McGrath, I think, was 48 at the time. He was very big on social justice issues. So it, it was kind of a new generation, I think, for the Catholics around here. Some of them weren't ready for it, probably, but <laughs> but I think the younger ones were really looking forward to it. God bless all of you. God grant all of us long years together building God's kingdom among the people of the Diocese of Owensboro. In January of 1983, Father Riney left Immaculate for his duties as pastor of Seabury and Providence. In February of the same year, Father John Meredith was welcomed to Immaculate. Another change was noted in the May 20th, 1984 edition of the Church Bulletin. Monsignor Powers writes, in a letter dated May 14, 1984, the Most Reverend Bishop announced a clerical change here at Immaculate. On June 14, 1984, I am to leave Immaculate Parish to go to school for one year. Father William Allard, presently the Newman Center Chaplain at Western Kentucky University in Bowling Green, will come as pastor of Immaculate. It was a very enjoyable period of time for me and a very enriching period of time. And, and the people responded real well, I thought, as a, as a faith community. And I touched their lives in many ways. You know, there were marriages and baptisms and graduations and funerals. So uh, I shared their life rather deeply, I think, while I was there. And they shared their lives with me, both the joys and the, and the sufferings in their lives. Hopefully, you know, I was, you know, uh, a source of enrichment for them as far as their own spirituality and life in God was concerned. Father Allard began his work at a church that had grown to 865 families. The first parish council was organized in 1985 with Mrs. Sue Hill as president. My name is Sue Helen Hill, but um, I did work with Father Allard. We would review uh, from one month to the next what was going to be brought up and then um, at one of our very first meetings the bishop come to that meeting so that was a special too. Well at the time we were setting up all the <clears throat> different committees, the social concerns, uh, uh, our um, representative to Catholic High, um, gosh that was in 85 so it's been a few years in the past. Two Ursuline nuns joined the staff. Sister Marie Goretti Browning was named parish coordinator, and Sister Julia Maria Head was named director of religious education. The prayer line was started during this period, and the reestablishment of the St. Vincent de Paul Society also took place. Another important movement in the Owensboro Diocese began during the mid-1980s that was envisioned by Bishop McRae. Renew was a three-year prayer study action process that focused on small faith-sharing groups. 
Immaculate shared in the Renew process and became closer through its many programs. Father Vincent Boyle replaced Father John Meredith in 1985 as associate pastor. Father Frank Roof became pastor from 1987 to 1989. Father Peter Lazan was associate pastor during this time and was replaced by Father Richard Cash. Father Danny Goff became an associate pastor in 1986 and was moved during the same year to Owensboro Catholic High School as the head of the religion department. The merger between Immaculate and other parochial schools created the Owensboro Catholic Middle School. This new middle school was housed at Immaculate. In January of 1990, Father Richard Powers assumed his duty as pastor, just after Father Roof joined the Air Force as chaplain. Well, I'm Father Richard Powers, and I was, was ordained in 1959, so I have 45 years of priesthood. I was uh, in the Navy as a chaplain when Bishop McRaith called and asked if I would consider uh, returning to the diocese to serve. Steve Montgomery, who was a Franciscan priest on loan to the diocese, came there as an associate. And he also, um, he taught at Brescia for like a semester. And he worked with me there for maybe a little over a year. And then he, he left to take another assignment. Um, I think Father Tom Joyce was a priest there for, I don't know, six, eight months, maybe a year, something like that as an associate. With all of these personnel changes came another structural change for Immaculate. The parish purchased a residence for the priests in 1991, across the street from the church, and the former rectory became the parish offices. We went across the street and bought a house. See, we had the rectory was also the parish offices and come and go all the time, and we try to live there at the same time, you know. So it had become quite a, a challenge to for a living quarters as well as office space because office spaces were, you know, the number of personnel was increasing because of the needs and the demands of the Second Vatican Council and the needs of the church like a religious education coordinator and, you know, a parish administrator. There just was not room for all of that in that rectory. Another change was around the corner as well. In the spring of 1993, Discussions had begun concerning the construction of a new parish hall. Change is always frightening to people, all of us, and especially if it's um, finances and they're tight, so it's, it's a risk. But life is a risk. You know, the church is people. It's not a building anyway. And, and the, the, what we call the Immaculate Church is the building that, that gives the, the Church of Immaculate an opportunity to come together, a place where it can unite, a place where it can gather, you know and this kind of moves it into that. Other structural features of the church were undergoing changes during the mid-1990s. Bill and Tom Buford remortared and regrouted the marble walls of the church. They also did brickwork on the sign in the front of the church. By May of 1995, the church bells had worn out. With good maintenance, they were able to last 30 years, twice the amount of time they were expected to remain in working condition. When Matt Gray came aboard and, and really began to, not that the music wasn't there before it was, but certainly he added a, a, a more of a, a living experience of music that the people could touch and relate to and be joined and pulled into. And music enhances and enlivens the liturgy. So I think that was one really big thing was, was the liturgy. Father Severin filled in as pastor for a couple of months until Father Timothy Sweeney took over on August 7, 1996. Father Timothy wrote in the August 4th edition of the Church Bulletin, Dear parishioners of Immaculate, on Wednesday, August 7, my appointment by Bishop McGraith as your pastor will take effect. Let me first say how delighted I am to be with you. I am also grateful, as I'm sure you all are, for the fine work done by Father Richard Powers. Let's all whisper a prayer that the Spirit guide us into the future. Sincerely yours in Christ, Father Timothy. I'm uh, Father Timothy Sweeney. 
I'm a Benedictine from St. Meinrad, and I've been pastor at Immaculate for the last eight years. I came here in August of 1996. Well, and to be honest, I only saw Immaculate in July of 1996 for the very first time. I didn't, I had to look it up. I didn't know where Immaculate was. So, uh, well, it was a little bit larger than I expected or I thought, but it looked pretty good. I mean, the church was well, looked to me like it was well constructed. Uh, the people were most uh, welcoming, etc. I mean, it was, uh, I was, I was pleased. By 1997, the demolition of the old parish office had taken place and new construction had begun on the new parish hall. Well, physically, when I first arrived, I was presented uh, with the blueprints for the new parish family center. I didn't know that that, that was what was being uh, planned. Uh, but all the groundwork for the new parish family center had been done by the previous pastor, Father Richard Powers. Well, I just happened to be the pastor and encouraged a lot, and, you know, uh, kept trying to fuel it and, and, you know, to encourage people to go on with it. And, you know, there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of challenge. Uh, the biggest fear, I think, was that it would really compete with, with the funds that were necessary to maintain the Catholic education for the children. That was a real fear that we would lose that. And um, certainly that was, that was a priority. But I think they became convinced that they could handle both. And then when, when they became convinced of that, then they went on for it, you know, which is a tremendous thing, I think. So physically, the physical plant, uh, that was the main thing that, that, uh, that was on the agenda when I first arrived. And that was rather quickly, now that I look back on it, rather quickly and uh, efficaciously completed, you know. The Jeff Birchinger family and the Terry Walker family named the new hall in the Name the Hall competition. The aptly named Immaculate Parish Family Center held its first official function on May 31, 1997. The first function was a reception that followed the ordinations to the priesthood. The parish family center was used for reception honoring these newly ordained. I feel like one of the most important things about it is it forms community. The church is community. And I think the parish hall gives people the chance to further that, to come together and form community so that the Eucharist, that is the bread of life and feeds us, to go out and, and be the bread of life for the, for the world. And as Mother Teresa one time said, you know, if you really love, then service has to follow that love. If there's not service, there's no love. And I think the Eucharist that feeds the faith of our people has to be nurtured and furthered. And this parish hall gives them the opportunity to come together for different reasons, different organizations, different little communities within this one and makes that happen. It forms a parish. The Jubilee year declared by the Holy Father commenced on Christmas 1999 and extended to Epiphany 2001. As Father Timothy expressed in the January 2nd, 2000 edition of the Church Bulletin, it is a year of special grace for each of us. Owensboro experienced God's grace just a few days later when a tornado ripped through the Immaculate area and through much of the city, causing great fear and destruction, but sparing all who laid in the path of the storm. A word from the pastor, January 9th, 2000. To my knowledge, as of this writing, no one in our parish was injured in our recent tornado. Thanks be to God. Some of you I know have suffered severe damage, and we do want to do whatever we can to assist you. 
By February of 2000, Immaculate Parish entered web space with its very own website. The site was produced to contain general information about the parish, the weekly bulletin, and an email address to keep parishioners connected with the staff and church information. Given the present situation in which we find ourselves with the real possibility of military action and war, some have suggested that we might establish a special time or event for our parish to pray. The evening rosary was begun during the Gulf War and has continued with a small group. Let's try to use the opportunities presently available to pray for our current world situation. March 23rd, 2003. As I write this, it looks likely that by the time you read this, we'll be at war in Iraq. Now we have to turn our prayer to the protection of the innocent in Iraq and the safety especially of the Americans, British and Australian military. May God grant a speedy end and a quick reconstruction of the country. It is evident that since the inception of Immaculate Church, it has grown into a majestic pillar of faith. With a fully functioning parish staff, Immaculate Parish is able to continue to be a working body that administers to those who call it home. The other area that I think we do a fine job in is providing opportunities for continued religious education, whether it be scripture study groups, or whether it be simply faith study groups. Those two areas are outstanding. We also have very good youth program for the high school youth. I'm Aaron John and I serve as the coordinator of youth ministry here at Immaculate Parish. I work mostly with uh, middle school and high school age kids and also help with our confirmation program. With our high school group, we meet every Thursday night from 7 to 9.30, and that is mainly an opportunity for them to take a break in the middle of the week. We have some sort of lesson or large group activity or game or faith discussion or small group sharing for about an hour, hour and a half of that time. And then the other time is for them to get help on their homework, some of them will do that, or go into the gym and play basketball and just hang out with their friends and just relax and get away from some of the other pressures that they have. Yeah, there's a lot of different components that we put into this um, based on what youth ministry is supposed to be from what the bishops say from the documents that they have. Uh, there's a lot of different components that go into it. It's not just fun and games and social, but we do a lot of faith sharing and community building in the mix of activity and trying to keep things lively. What always interests me is when students graduate from high school and they go off to college or they might even stay in town and go to college. And they'll stop by and still see us at the office and keep updated on some of the activities that we have. And that's one of the big things, is just knowing that the services that we offer here, the opportunities that we offer, stick with them and do make some sort of an impression. Each member of the current church staff is an integral piece of the parish orchestra. The parish provides a, a location for worship. And that's not just the weekend masses on the weekend, but also the daily masses. And certainly providing, the parish provides uh, the sacraments for our parishioners. But we also, because we are, well, uh, by analogy, we are sort of a family, so that we also provide there's a lot of social activities that go on here. And there is also religious education, not just for the children, but also for adults. Committees, such as the Family Life Committee and the Social Concerns Committee, address specific issues facing the church. 
The Parish Pastoral Council is another important part of the community. Meetings are generally held the third Wednesday of each month. Parishioners are encouraged to place items on the agenda to help further improvements in daily church life. Organizations include the Men's Club, Legion of Mary, St. Vincent de Paul, Over 50s Group, It, it combines, the parish provides, not just spiritual opportunities for the, for the people, but also social opportunities. And by providing the social opportunities, you're building a community and a stronger, well, more well-knit community. So they, they were pretty much a community-oriented people. And I think that was, that's some of the things that I really cherish about, you know. They were community. Each person that has stepped foot onto this blessed land in its first 50 years has contributed to its important story. There are many faces that have passed through its glorious history that have made an impact on its faith community. More important than its beautiful buildings, than its symbolic decorations, is its enduring spirit that comes from the body of the church. the holy people that have worshiped within its walls and have worked to build a legacy of love are a testimony to God's love in the world. From the early decree of Bishop Francis R. Cotton proclaiming the existence of Immaculate Parish to the continued blessings received in the 50-year celebration service, Immaculate Parish continues to be a living, breathing embodiment of Jesus Christ. Through the continued reception of the sacraments, the faith community of Immaculate Parish will continue to grow in Christ. We can now look to the future in serving the Lord with our mission of faith. I do think, though, in the next 50 years, uh, the parish will continue.